coming up on this month's show. We start our top 10 countdown of the best photo locations on the Isle of Skye, I challenge a couple of the show's experts to catch a steam train twice, and we test run a super high resolution mirrorless camera and give away a professional filter kit worth £250. Welcome to a brand new show for a brand new decade. It's our January 2020 edition of Photography Online. We'll be uploading a fresh new show every month talking all things photography from on location features to kit reviews, editing techniques to tutorials and we're going to be throwing in some amazing prizes as well. We'll also be introducing a feature called Mission Possible where we help you to take those ambitious shots you just never thought you could and we'll be throwing a few challenges out to our team of pros as well. I know you'll join me in wishing them nothing but rotten luck, hindrance and ultimate failure. Above all, the purpose of Photography Online is to inspire and enthuse anyone with a passion for photography to pick up their camera and go out there armed with new confidence and knowledge to take those pictures they never thought they could. Each month we'll be featuring a motivational photography quote and this month comes from the legendary Robert Kappa who once said the photographs are there, you just need to take them. Looking around he is definitely not wrong. Which leads us into our first feature on location where we follow pro photographers as they go about their daily business seeing just what it's like making a living with your camera. This month we're following Photography Online's Harry Martin as he leads a group of photographers around one of the world's most dramatic mountain ranges. Each year, I lead an eight-day photo holiday to the Dolomites for worldwide explorers. Due to the terrain, this is as much a hiking trip as it is a photographic one, so we insist that all customers have a decent level of fitness. Welcome to the Dolomites. The Italian Dolomites are without doubt one of the most photogenic mountain ranges in the world. The Southern Andes are the only other range which would be a serious contender for the crown but the advantage of the Dolomites is its ease of access. With a comprehensive network of roads, lifts and trails, reaching all but the most remote areas. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, Dolomiti is a small region of the Alps, identifiable from others by the unique mineral which gives the area its name. This also gives the mountains a brighter than usual tone, which reflects the light and alpine glow. If you're looking to join an organised trip to the Dolomites, then you'll be spoiled for choice in terms of who you go with. But what makes this World Wide Explorers trip unique is that we stay half our nights high up in the mountains at remote refuges, as this gets us into the ideal locations for dawn and dusk light. This year, my group's made up of customers from the UK, Turkey, Germany and the US. Most of them are reasonably experienced photographers, but mountain photography comes with unique challenges. So one of my jobs is to highlight these and ensure everyone is getting the best potential from the scene. An easy mistake to make when you're faced with epic views like this is to shoot it too wide and we just end up including too much. Whereas with a telephoto lens zooming in, and that's looking really good at the moment, just really focusing into those layers. Although it can be tempting to shoot everything at super wide angles, this has the effect of making the mountains appear small and as a result, you lose some of the drama. Shooting with a standard to short telephoto often produces a much better sense of grandeur which you witness when standing in these epic locations. Some of the mountain refuges we stay at are just below 3,000 metres in altitude, but fortunately there are usually cable cars or chairlifts which can take us most of the way. This is a huge help when carrying a heavy pack of camera equipment. Once everyone has had a chance to get to know the area, we refuel on some home-cooked food, one of the many appeals of these family-run refuges. On the subject of food, Italy is well known for its cuisine, but here in the Dolomites, they take it to another level. We usually arrive at each refuge around mid-afternoon, which gives us time to settle in and explore the area. One thing we try not to do on our trips is line everyone up in the obvious spot so that they all get the same photo. I try to encourage everyone to go off and find their own subjects and compositions, as this is what defines a photographer, their creative input. I see it as my job to check they're not making any technical mistakes by shooting at the wrong ISO or aperture, or missing something epic which they might not be aware of. I let them know where the sun will set 
and where it will rise in the morning so they can plan where they might want to be to shoot in the best light. It's then just a case of capturing what we see as the sun sinks between the distant summits and the mountains reflect the warm hues of the evening sky. There's something magical about being up high in the mountains and watching the world come alive. As the sun's first rays paint the peaks of the Dolomites, the silence is only broken by the sound of camera shutters and calling chuff. Along with all the advantages of being up here in remote areas, there are of course disadvantages. One of these would be the basic toilet facilities, although no one would complain about the view from this loo. As well as shooting some of our favourite remote locations, we understand that our customers don't want to miss the classic Dolomite shots either. Locations such as Lago de Braze are not difficult to get to, but difficult to ignore if you're in the area. In places like these, you just need to be prepared to rub shoulders with other photographers and a few Instagrammers. Towards the end of the trip, I tend to help customers with their editing. It's amazing how many photographers will over-edit their images, almost undoing all the hard work they put in to get the photo in the first place. So I see it as a mission to steer people towards the direction of keeping their images natural and faithful to how the scene was at the time. This is, after all, what landscape photography should be about. After eight days of summit panoramas, valley views, great food and good company, all good things have to come to an end. I always leave the Dolomites with a heavy heart, but happy in the knowledge that it will only be another 50 weeks before I arrive back for another adventure. Having worked closely with these guys over the past couple of years, I've witnessed firsthand just how much preparation goes into making these trips happen. The part where the customers are there it really is just the tip of the iceberg, and we're excited to show you some of the planning stages a little bit later on in the year. Now, future on locations include following a fashion photographer as he goes about shooting a cover image. We're going to be following an elopement photographer as she battles with the inclement Scottish weather. And next month, we're going to be following a commercial photographer as he documents a personal project at one of London's best kept secrets. Next up, it's our regular feature, Essential Camera Skills, which basically does what it says on the tin. This month, we've got the whole team together to discuss filters. First up, it's Marcus to explain the basics. To put it simply, filters are a piece of either glass or plastic that you place in front of the lens and it affects the light that's reaching the sensor of the camera. Now, they come in uh, a couple of major formats. One is square ones like these, and the other one is round ones like these. Now, the advantage of a square system is that you can have multiple uh, filters all sliding down in front of the lens like that, and then we could put another one on in front of that, for example. We've got three filters on here at the moment. We've got a polarizer at the back, We've got uh, a neutral density, which we'll have a look at in a minute, and then we've got a neutral density graduated filter. So we've got three filters on there. If we were to do that with round filters, uh, we would get something called vignetting, where every time we add another filter to the front here, it gets this tube gets longer and longer and longer, and it starts appearing in the corners of the picture. Another advantage with this system here, as well is that if you've got two filters, like I've got here, I've got one at the back and one at the front, I can move that one out the back without affecting the one at the front. Obviously, when you've got multiple filters screwed into the front and you want to move the back one, you have to unscrew the front one, then unscrew the back one, then put the front one back on. It's a big faff. So, square modular system's definitely the way to go, just gonna cost you a little bit more money. So let's look at what filters are available on the market, because there are literally hundreds of them, but most of them are just gimmicks. Um, for example, if you've got a filter that turns a point of light into a star, or another one would be a tobacco graduated filter which adds an instant sunset to any scene, throw them in the bin, very 1980s, you don't want to be seen in public with them, very bad for your street cred. So we're going to be looking at three main filters, a polarizer, a neutral density and a neutral density graduated filter. So let's look at them one at a time. 
Today I'm going to show you how and when you may want to use one of these, a neutral density filter, otherwise known as an ND filter. Basically they act like a pair of sunglasses for your camera, reducing the amount of light coming through the lens. So there's two main reasons why you may want to use an ND filter. The first would be to say allow you to increase the exposure time. Uh, the second one would be allow you to narrow your depth of field. Take for instance the camera which is on me. It is set to an aperture of f8 which as you can see you can see a bit more of the background and the exposure time is 1 50th of a second. Now that can't be changed for technical reasons. So to allow us to reduce the aperture down to say f2 so you cannot see the background behind me we would have to put an ND filter in place like this. And as you can see, the background behind me is now more out of focus. ND filters come in many strengths, with 3, 6, 10 and 15 being the most common. Here I have a 3 stop and my hand is most likely visible through it, so this is the weakest one I have. And a 10 stop where you can't see my hand through it. When using the darker NDs such as the 10 and the 15, you will need to compose and focus your photo before putting one in place. Uh, because they are so dark, you won't be able to see anything. Here are a couple of shots taken using a 10 stop ND filter, which has allowed an exposure time of several seconds or more even in bright conditions. This has resulted in any slow moving elements such as the clouds to blur with motion. So the ND filters which I use are the ones I've already been showing you, which are the square ones. Um, as Marcus has already mentioned, you can also buy circular screw-in filters. Here I have what's called a variable ND. Now this is a cheaper option because um, it gives you many stops in one. This one goes from three to six stops, so you've got three, four, five, six. So you've got four stops worth of ND filter there. So as you turn the front of the filter like I'm doing here, the strength of the ND changes. Although these are a cheaper alternative, the effect can be quite inconsistent across the frame. So if you're serious about your photography, my advice would be to go for the square system like I use here. Now here's Harry to show you a different type of filter. So I'm going to be showing you how to use these neutral density graduated filters. Now unlike neutral density filters, these only darken a portion of the image and have a transition line between the dark area and the light area. This allows us to control the exposure in just a portion of the image rather than the whole thing. So if we hold it up, we can see that we can darken just a bright sky rather than all of the detail in the foreground. A good example of when you want to use a neutral density graduated filter is when you're shooting directly into the light, dawn or dusk, you end up with a very bright sky and or a very underexposed foreground. So we're going to be losing detail in one part or another if we don't use one. Having a neutral density graduated filter then means we can slide it down and darken just a portion of the image and that allows us to retain the detail in all the crucial areas. As we line the filter up, it doesn't need to be a level horizon as we can twist the filter holder like this, say if we've got a sloping hill in our image for example. Like neutral density filters, graduated filters also come in different strengths, the most common being two, three and four stops. More importantly however, they come in different transitions. So, they'll come in hard transitions like this one, or soft graduated filters like this one. Soft graduated filters are helpful if there are elements poking up into the sky and we need to have a more gradual transition. Hard graduated filters are helpful if we're shooting clear seascapes with a very open horizon and no elements distracting from the sky. Now, I'm going to hand back over to Ruth who's going to show you our final filter, the polarizer. So this is the filter that I've got the most experience in using. This one's my one, it's a circular one and it screws into the front of the lens but it still allows you to rotate it which is important as we're about to see. A polarising filter or a polarizer reduces reflections from shiny surfaces and it works to varying degrees depending on the angle of light. Watch what happens as I rotate the polarizer on the front of the lens. You can see that the reflections on shiny surfaces are being reduced to varying degrees as I turn the filter. It's then simply a case of leaving it set in the position which gives me my desired result. So a really important thing to remember when you're using a polarizing filter is that it reduces the amount of light getting into the lens which you're going to have to compensate for. It's a really good reason why you don't want to be walking around with one permanently attached to your lens because the exposure is going to be around about four times longer. Now there's many different brands of filters out there from budget versions to really top spec ones but the golden rule to remember is that there's no point spending a lot of money on a great body and lens and then putting a cheap filter on the front so always buy the best you can afford.
As you can see, filters can really enhance your images. If you don't have any in your kit yet, we're actually giving away a set at the end of the show. So stick around and find out how you can be in with a chance of winning these. Now, moving on with this month's kit corner, we're field testing the Panasonic Lumix S1R. This is the Lumix S1R, S1R, S1R. Panasonic's new full-frame mirrorless camera. A 47.3 megapixel full-frame sensor. Up to nine frames per second high-speed shooting. But what is it actually like to use in the field? Now, one of the arguments for mirrorless cameras often uh, kind of touted by people is that they're lightweight, it's going to make your camera bag lighter, it's better for your back, great, I'm well up for that, but um, I'm holding this camera and I'm thinking, this, it doesn't feel particularly light. Um, now that's not a negative, as I say it feels really, really good in the hand, uh, but I just want to compare it to my current EOS R. Um, so let's stick this on the scales and let's have a look. There we are. So that's, that's coming in at a good 2.2 kilos which is not light for a camera, um, but this has got the 70 to 200 lens on it, so that's not too bad. But let's compare it to my EOS R, also with 70 to 200 lens on, so it's a, it's a direct comparison. Already in the hand, I can, I can feel how much lighter that is, but let's be scientific about this, let's pop it on. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's coming up as 1.8 kilos, so much, much lighter. So. The argument for a mirrorless camera being particularly light, it, it varies massively between camera and you just have to pose that question to yourself, is it really going to make that difference? Now Panasonic kindly lent me two lenses. Um, I've got the 24-105 f4 and the one I've got here on the moment is the 70-200 f4. Now not really uh, a wildlife lens, but because it's such a high resolution sensor, I've also had a huge amount of flexibility in being able to crop my image. The sharpness of the images, even after cropping to say 50%, was just outstanding. It was really, really crisp. Drops of water falling off the fur. Um, now I haven't obviously shot much wildlife on the 24 to 105, this being primarily a landscape lens, but equally, um, a sharp lens. This is more of the, the kit lens version. Now there is an adapter that you can use to fit Canon lenses onto this Panasonic. Um, now I haven't managed to get my hands on one of those yet, um, but I'd be really interested in seeing how some of the Canon lenses perform on this Lumix camera. The S1R has two shooting modes. So the first is mode number one, and that's for those that want that oh so satisfying camera click. But if you want to be super stealthy, which we often need to if we're shooting wildlife, flick it into mode two. Continually shooting, not a noise. You've got more chance of scaring off an otter with your rumbly tummy than with this camera. So battery life, something that's often criticized for mirrorless cameras. I really had no complaints. I only got one battery sent with the camera. So I've had to be careful not only that I don't have any spares, but I still get three to 500 shots, which I think would be comparable. It's a nice big battery, decent size, and uh, that overall makes the camera a little heavier. And uh, that's, not really a problem for me. I'd rather have a, a decent sized battery that's gonna last me than uh, have something that's gonna run out in the middle of a shoot. Um, so that's been really fairly good considering we've got really good bright screen and the electronic viewfinder and all the other gizmos on the camera. Now, one noticeable difference I found between this and my Canon uh, is if we open this up here. Now, now let's, we're gonna count here, one, two, two card slots. Uh, one is SD, high format SD, and the other is XQD. Um, not something I've used. Uh, I don't, none of my other cameras take XQD cards, but I don't know if I was to keep this camera, you'd get some there. They're um, high performance and high speed writing cards, and they perform slightly better than SDs, so um, it's good to have that option. I would probably still lean towards the Canon, and there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm familiar with Canon. Um, I 
I already have all of their lenses. Um, you can put them onto the, the S1R with an adapter, but it's never gonna work quite as well as it does with um, the native Canon cameras. I do prefer the electronic viewfinder on the Canon camera compared to the, to the Lumix, but the overall image quality out of the camera of this, the sharpness, especially of this 70 to 200 lens, is just outstanding. So it's a, it's a really close call, and I think if I didn't already have an existing camera system, the, uh, the S1R would be a very, very tempting prospect indeed. Thanks, Harry. Now, staying with Harry in more ways than one, I set him and one of our other experts the challenge of photographing the Jacobite Express steam train, known to all Harry Potter fans as the Hogwarts Express. But there was a twist to the task, and it could take some wizardry for them to be triumphant. So, let me explain the background to the challenge. We were chatting to Ruth the other day about the Jacobite Express, and that's the steam train that runs from Fort William to Mallet once a day. We were telling her how we'd discovered a potential new viewpoint um, next to a church. Now, most people will head to the Glenfin and Viaduct itself. Now, if you've ever seen the Harry Potter movies, that's where the train passes over the bridge. It looks fantastic. We wanted to try something a little bit different. So, Ruth has challenged us to shoot both in one day. Now, the trouble is, the train only runs between those two locations once a day. So, we need to get from the Glenfin and Viaduct to our new alternative viewpoint um, and try and beat the train. I reckon it takes about 40 minutes to drive there. Trouble is, the train takes about the same amount of time, so it's going to be pretty tight, but I reckon we can do it. There's only one way to find out, though. We're here at the first location, and we've parked so that we're hopefully not going to get blocked in, because on the way back we're going to have to make a really quick getaway. But we've got about a 10 minute walk to get to the shooting point, so follow us. If you fancy coming to photograph the Jacobite Express train yourself, it's important to remember that it only runs between the end of April to the end of October. There are often two services per day, but it's only the morning service which has the steam engine, something which no doubt disappoints anyone that turns up for the afternoon service. Of course, the steam train returns over the viaduct in the afternoon, but due to a lack of a turntable at Malig, it faces backwards, and that kind of looks a bit strange in photographs. We're at our first shooting location now, and uh, I've set up here, and as you can see, I've purposely excluded any of the sky, um, because I don't want any really bright areas, because there's lots of deep shadows going on down here. However, I do have to allow for when the train comes over, we're obviously expecting a lot of steam to come out, and that's gonna be really white, the brightest part of the image. So as you can see, I've left a little bit of a gap on the right-hand side of the histogram there for that steam to occupy when it comes over. Obviously, we only get one chance at this, so we've got to get it right first time. Um, and then once the train's gone over, we're just going to pack up as quickly as we can and run back down to the car and see if we can get to the next viewpoint. The challenge is on. And you might be wondering, because there's two photographers here, why don't we just put one photographer at the other location and one come here, and then we can do both together easily? Well, first of all, that wouldn't be much of a challenge. And second of all, Harry's too young to be left unsupervised, so we have to keep together. The train passes the viaduct around 10.50 most mornings and the driver will often go slowly to make photography just a little bit easier. We now need to get back to the car, Excuse me, please. drive 30 minutes down the road and try to overtake the train, ready to catch it at the second location. Find out later on who chalks out the first point in our Challenger series. Now I'm really looking forward to counting down the top 10 locations on the Isle of Skye, a place I call home and the home of Photography Online HQ. It's always attracted photographers from all over the world due to its amazing diversity of subjects and we're excited to show you our favourite locations to go with a camera. To get the series started we're going to visit a place that's only a couple of miles from my doorstep and a view which literally stops traffic.
we start our countdown of the top 10 views on Sky with Loch Fada. This is one of the classic views on Sky, with rowing boats often moored at the southern end, a picturesque island complete with tree in the middle, and the mighty star and its old man at the northern end. If you look on a map, you'll see that Loch Fada and Loch Lethen are actually one body of water. Many people don't realise that both are man-made lochs, formed by a hydro dam at the northern end. Incidentally, the railway lines which transport workers from the top and the bottom of the dam is the only railway on Sky. Thought I'd mention that in case it ever comes up in a pub quiz. One of the major attractions of this location is the ease of access. It's literally right on the side of the A855, just a few miles north of Portree, Sky's principal town. And though you can get a semi-decent shot by leaning out of your car window, I definitely recommend parking and getting out to have a wander around. Pass through this gate and you'll get to this elevated view which is the most popular to take photos of. What works from being up this high is that you can see water behind the island which gives it separation. The best time to come here is really at dawn when the first light of the morning illuminates the star in the background. It also increases the chances of finding a reflection on the water, which obviously this morning we don't have, but the light is fantastic, so I'm going to go down and have a wee wander around. As you walk lower down the bank towards the loch, you'll see that the island starts to get lost against the background, which means you lose one of the focal points in the scene. However, once you accept that the island isn't going to play a part in your composition, you can look for other subjects down by the water's edge. Small trees like this one can work well in the foreground of a photo. During winter, Loch Fada often freezes over and this can result in some strange scenes occurring. With a mirror reflection and golden light hitting the hills, this will be one of the best views you're ever likely to see. It's probably not worth coming in the middle of the day as the light will be behind you and there's very little chance of seeing calm reflective waters. If you come here in the winter, this is a great place to watch the northern lights. With unobstructed views to the north, little light pollution and the night sky being reflected in the water, Loch Fada is the perfect place to enjoy the night sky with or without an aurora. Heading a little further down the road than our elevated viewpoint, it's worth exploring the rowing boats, which are moored here from May through to October. With their numbers, assuming they're in the right order, they make a great photographic subject. Once you've finished admiring the view over Loch Fada, you can either head north and climb the store, or you can head south to Portree for a relaxing coffee and cake. If you're familiar with Sky, you might be able to guess some of our remaining locations, but we do promise there will be a few surprises in there as well. If you've never been to the island but were whetting your appetite a little bit, then I'd highly recommend this. It's the Photographer's Guide to Sky, written by one of our experts. It contains all the information you need as a photographer on the top 50 locations on the island. It's available in hard copy and digital at the link below. So far on the show, we've looked at a camera, a location, and how to use filters, but the final step in any image is editing. Now, we all know how annoying those videos can be where you've got to skip through piles of waffle before you actually get to the point. And with that in mind, we've kept ours to exactly a minute, hence the title, 60 Second Editing Skills. First in the series is Marcus, and yes, we do have a clock running to make sure that he sticks to time. This month, I'm going to show you how to adjust the contrast of an image in Lightroom. So I've chosen this photo here uh, because it should naturally contain a pure black and a pure white. But as you'll see from the histogram up here, um, we've got a gap on the left hand side, which means the darkest point of this picture isn't quite pure black. And the brightest point of this picture, which will be down here in the water somewhere, isn't a pure white by changing the brightest point to a pure white and the darkest point to a pure black, we're essentially gonna increase the contrast. So it's very straightforward. 
we go down here to the basic panel and where we have white so I'm going to push this fader to the right and I'm just going to look at the histogram I'm not going to look at the image and I'm just going to keep it going until the histogram just touches the right hand side what we've effectively done there is we've made the brightest point of this picture a pure white uh, now I'm going to do the opposite to the blacks and take it to the left hand side just looking at the histogram until the histogram just touches the left hand side and now we've assigned the darkest point of that picture to being a pure black. Uh, as you can see, the contrast has increased quite a lot just by those two fader movements. So now I'm going to raise the shadows a little bit, which is essentially reducing the contrast, but in a slightly different way to what we just did with the blacks. And I'm going to reduce the highlights a little bit, which just bring back a little bit more detail in the highlights. So the only thing I'm going to do now is adjust the clarity, which increases the contrast in the mid-tones and then we're going to do a before and after comparison so that was before did anything and that's what it looks like after those five simple fader movements so there's obviously lots more changes i can do to this image but for now my 60 seconds is up expertly done now earlier on in the show we left harry and marcus rushing down a hill in hot pursuit of a train as they tried to beat my challenge of photographing the same train in two different locations without the aid of a magic wand can they do it Let's find out. Excuse me, please. They're all thinking, blimey, they're in a hurry to get back. Excuse me, please, I've got a train to catch. Thank you. Where are the keys? I, I, you've got the world. No, come on, stop messing about. Check your, check your pockets. Them, I well, I don't have them. Come on, I, you. Shortly after passing over the viaduct, the train makes a scheduled stop at Glenfinnan Station, which gives us an outside chance of beating it to the next location. The train takes a more direct route than the road, so we need to take the long way round. Luckily, there are no traffic lights or roundabouts in this area, so as long as we don't get caught behind a German camper van, we should make good time. As we arrive, we have no idea if the train's already passed, but we didn't see it on our way, so we're hopeful that we're not too late. Now it's just a case of setting up as quickly as possible. Unlike the first location, we need to include the sky in this shot, which means the added task of attaching filters to help manage the exposure range of a backlit black train in front of a bright white sky. Well, we've, how long have we been here now? Uh, it must be about three minutes or so. So we could have walked down the hill casually. Save ourselves the effort. This isn't much of a challenge, is it? No. So let me explain some numbers to you here. Um, as you can see, I'm on ISO 200. Uh, reason for that is that I need to be at F8 because the train, ideally, I want it to be about here, but I also want the church to be reasonably sharp. So I need F8 to give me the depth of field. I'm probably gonna need a hundredth of a second to freeze the movement of the train. Um, so once that's fixed and that's fixed, to get the right exposure, I have to go to ISO 200. I don't wanna go any higher than ISO 200 because this is the 5D SR. It doesn't perform particularly well at high, higher ISOs. If it was a Mark IV, which is my other camera, then I'd probably push that to ISO 400 or even 800, which would give me a faster shutter speed. But for this camera, those are the right settings to get the optimum result. Biscuit? Yeah, why not? Oh, yeah, great. Tell you what, hope these challenges become more challenging. This is easy so far, isn't it? successful, wasn't it? 
Uh, that's 1-0 to the team, I believe. Oh yeah, good job. Clearly I need to up the ante for the next challenge. Don't worry, I already have a few ideas. Let me just jot some down before I forget. Let's see, manure, blindfold, and uh, ooh, waxing strips. Should do it. Now it is giveaway time. We promised earlier on in the show that we're going to be giving away a filter set and here it is. This is right at the top end of the quality spectrum. Case is the brand which all of our photography online experts have in their own kit bags and they've come out top in lots of independent filter reviews over the past couple of years. Now I've been told that even though their filters are made from the highest quality optical glass, they're virtually unbreakable and to prove it, they've asked me to drop one on the ground, which I am slightly worried about, I have to say, but I've got one here and I'm gonna do this. I've just spotted a very pointy rock, so let's have a shot at this. Well, that's gonna save you some money right there. Basically, these are the best on the market and we're giving away a set from Case to be able with a chance of winning this set, which consists of a filter holder, an ND grad and a polarizer. All you need to do is visit the link below and answer the following question. Which filter would you use to reduce the exposure of a bright sky? Is it A, polarizer, B, neutral density, or C, neutral density grad? To submit your answer, please go to the link below before the 12th of January. I'll be announcing the winner in our next show. Speaking of which, our February edition of Photography Online will be available right here. So do hit subscribe so you're notified as soon as it becomes available. Finally, I just want to thank you for being with us for this, our very first show. We really appreciate you giving us your time. If you have enjoyed it, feel free to pass word on to your family and friends or comment down below. Next month, I'll be back as Marcus talks me through what must be one of the most ambitious shots he's ever come up with. Until then, take good care, but most of all, take good photos.